Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. Today, we're talking to Dr. Stephanie Liu. She's the face of Life of a Doctor Mom. You can find her on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. She's going to talk with us today about newborn skin care. There's so much to go over in just general skincare regime and how to deal with some of the three most common issues we hear about as family doctors. We'll get to it right after this quick reminder. Welcome to the She Found Motherhood podcast. We are doctors Sarah and Alicia, maternity physicians and moms who have been through it all. We want to empower you with knowledge so you can have the best pregnancy, birth, and postpartum experience you can. She Found Health and She Found Motherhood is meant for general medical information only. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This information does not apply to every situation. If you have questions or if you've received different advice, please contact your healthcare provider. Always seek the advice of your physician or another qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. The views expressed by She Found Health and She Found Motherhood and our guests are not representative of any of the institutions with which we are affiliated. Some of our podcast episodes are sponsored so that we can keep getting great info out there to you, our listeners. We only partner with companies that we truly believe in. Some of our links and suggestions may be affiliates, and we would appreciate you using them to help fund this important work. Now let's get to it. I'm so excited today. Dr. Stephanie Liu from Life of Dr. Mom is joining us and we are talking all things newborn skincare. This is something that we both see all the time in the office and we have patients and new parents asking us questions about it. The skin is so thin and sensitive and we need to take good care of it, both for the short term, but also for long term skin health for those babies. Stephanie, thank you for joining us today. Why don't we start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you came to be where you are? Yeah, thanks. I'm so happy to be here chatting with you. So my name is Stephanie and I'm a family doctor. I practice in Edmonton, Alberta. And five years ago, I had my daughter, Maddie. I have two kids, Maddie and George. But becoming a first-time parent, I realized, one, it's really not as easy as I thought it was going to be. Breastfeeding was intuitive. Sleep training was really wonky. And even just like everyday things that, you know, I never thought were a big deal. Like, how do I get my babies to like food? things like that, I realized that I didn't know that much about. And so it actually inspired me to create a blog called Life of Dr. Mom, where I go through these questions that I had, my patients have, and I actually want to create relatable, but also evidence-based information that I can share with, with our community. That's so awesome. Thank you so much. So why don't we get into talking about newborn skincare? And so one of the topics that we're talking about is one of your kind of blogs from a couple of years ago. So we'll link that blog below so people can get some more info. But yeah. Okay. So we're going to get into it. So let's just talk about basic newborn skincare. Like I said, those newborns, they're fresh, they're sweet, they're lovely, but they have very thin skin. And so we need to make sure that we're doing things to take care of it, both in the short term and also for the long term. So why don't you walk us through what your basic advice is for basic skincare routine in for new parents? Yeah, so in general for babies, newborns, uh, less is more. So I try to rec- I'd recommend avoiding heavy scented products cuz scented products can actually be super irritating for babies. It's important to hydrate the baby's skin with fragrance-free products um, that often thicker ones I find actually help moisturize the skin better. Bathing is good, but when you're bathing, really limit the use of soaps. I like to kind of hope that babies, like especially newborns, are kind of self-cleaning. So we really don't need much soap when you're washing the baby. And if you are, just use it towards the end of the bath and then kind of take the baby out. One other tip that I like is after you take the baby out of the bath and they're still wet, just patting dry the skin and leaving a thin layer of moisture and then locking in that moisture with a a fragrance-free cream. Yeah, that's awesome. So, and the other thing, people think that they need to bathe their babies every day. You do not need to bathe their babies every day. A couple times a week is plenty, or if they have a big poop explosion or some major issue that's happened, but certainly babies, like you said, are self-cleaning. So a couple times a week, maybe every second day is fine. Some people incorporate it as part of their bedtime routine. And that's fine if you want to do that, but you do not need to bathe your babies every day. And so I agree totally with what you said. I just usually say use the soap on the stinky bits. So if they're stinky or dirty, right? Like those creases underneath their neck, their armpits and their perineal area, or if they had a big poop explosion, obviously you can wipe down wherever the poop was, but you don't need to use soap everywhere all the time. And like you said, once you take the baby out, pat them dry, don't dry them totally off and then put that good moisturizing, goopy, creamy, Vaseline-y, creamy, ointment-y type products. So, you know, a couple of the products that I usually suggest to parents in terms of skincare, like you said, so non-scented, 
no extra colors, no extra perfumes, nothing fancy. So I usually stick to like the CeraVe or the Cetaphil or the, I love Vaseline Petroleum Jelly. It's cheap and easy. And you've actually created a great product that we'll talk a little bit about the end at the end with that beta glucan, which is a really good, it keeps moisture in really effectively. So that can be a really good thing to do. And then the other thing is that moisturizing that you talked about. And that's what I really like to suggest people putting into their pre-bedtime routine is a nice little massage for baby, right? Now, some people want to do things a little bit, and I'm using quotation marks and people can't see me natural. And so they often ask about what kind of products that are more natural can I use? And we know that we're not supposed to put food on our skin before it's been introduced in our mouth because we can get allergies to it. But one thing that is okay to use from a more natural point of view is like the olive oils are fine, but also coconut oil is fine because it's very low allergenic. So our pediatric allergists say if somebody wants to use like a food-based product for a moisturizer, then coconut oil would be the one that they would choose. What's your sense on that? What's your kind of, what do you suggest to people in terms of moisturizers? So moisturizers, I'm kind of with you. I like uh, the Cetaphil, the CeraVe, and I like Vaseline. I actually never really uh, used um olive oil for my kids I just didn't like the greasy feel and I think for my kids everyone's a little bit different but my kids even with sometimes with Vaseline I feel like they kind of don't like the texture of it so I use more of kind of moisturizing and less less oily cream for my kids but I have heard that some do like the olive oil yeah I think yeah and I think the coconut oil is a better option of those two as well but yeah I agree with you I just use a the creamy yeah. ointments more and like the creamy Vaseline was a good one too yeah. And sometimes with the coconut oil, I have had one, a very handful of patients that have reacted just because not all coconut oils are the same, right? Some of them have additives and that can be a little bit irritating for the skin. Yeah, that's a really good thing. So make sure that you're looking at the ingredients of whatever product you're buying because you want to make sure whatever you're using is clean and has minimal extra stuff added to it, whatever you're using on your baby's skin and on your skin for that matter. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So we talked about general skincare. So that's great. Some people, some of those babies, those little one to two week old babies that are, their whole skin is peeling off. I call them like a little snake, right? Like they almost lose that outer layer. Yeah. So when there's big cracks or then I'll tell people to put Vaseline petroleum jellies on those kind of more cracks or where that super peely skin is. So it, if you don't like the texture of Vaseline petroleum jelly or whatever alternative, then you can use it on those really dry bits and the rest of it just like a bit more of a creamy moisturizer is fine as well. So why don't we move on to diaper rash? This is super common, especially I find in first time babies. Once you've had one child, you've figured it out a little bit. Although, like you said, every skin is different. And I really like your approach to this, the A, B, C, D, and for providers, E. So do you want to walk us through your kind of approach to managing diaper rash? Yeah, so diaper rash is super common. Also, of my babes actually had diaper rash. Daughter worse is, you know, I was really, I didn't realize how frequently you had to change diapers for little ones. And I'm so glad that you like the ABCDE acronym. I like it too. And it's something that I go through uh, with, with my patients. So the first one is air. That's one thing that I did with my kids. There were a few accidents. So that's allowing diaper free time. Sometimes that's not always practical, but just allowing air in that area, that kind of is healing because we know that diaper rash occurs and, you know, there's poop and pee that's kind of sticking to the bottom area and that causes a lot of irritation to the skin. The next thing is B for barrier. So applying a, a nice topical to where the rash is. So I really like zinc oxide based um, base topicals. Next thing C is cleansing. So making sure that that area is clean. So making sure that, you know, the poop that's there is cleaned off. And once again, you know, I really like using fragrance free, like unscented products, because that can be a little bit irritating for babes. And the other thing that's important to note is that after uh, you put on that zinc oxide cream or whatever barrier cream you choose, you'll see that there's still quite a bit of that white film barrier paste there. You don't need to wipe it off completely. You just need to wipe off that poop and you can just kind of the rest of that residual white stuff there because aggressive wiping can really mess up the skin. Baby wipes too. I find for my kids, I really like the fragrance free stuff because that can be irritating to, to some little bum bums too. Then uh, diapers, making sure that you're using, I, I really like diapers that weren't super fragrancy and getting diapers that are really super absorbent because that kind of helps keep the moisture away from, from the bum. And then the E is, you know, just talking parents uh, and making sure that we're avoiding products that could be irritating to the skin. Sometimes, you know, in, in severe cases, other medications may be needed in that area. So if it's not improving with the ABCD, make sure you're checking with a healthcare provider to make sure that nothing else wonky is going on. 
Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll go through some of the things that I usually recommend. So the airtime is great too. Now you have to be a bit careful. They're going to pee and poo all over the place. So make sure you put a nice towel down under them wherever they are. Don't put them on your nice new fancy couch if you're giving them some airtime. So put something under them to absorb that that urine or the if they have a bowel movement and that's totally fine and the other thing is making sure that they're nice and dry before you put that next diaper on so if you're giving them a wipe down dry them with the diaper before you put that next diaper on so make sure their skin is nice and dry before you apply the next diaper i personally just used my kids weren't too bad in terms of they had skin stuff elsewhere but not too bad in their bum so when i used disposable diapers i would just put vaseline petroleum jelly on them and i use those more at night because they were sitting against baby's skin whereas during the day we used more of the cloth diapers so it just once they were sleeping a little bit longer i'd use the disposables at night just because they wicked like you said they wicked that moisture away from the skin a bit more effectively and that urine and that poop Despite how quickly you get to change them, even if you're doing a super awesome job and changing them frequently, it's just really harsh on the skin. That's where you have that to that barrier cream. And some people ask, do I need the barrier cream all the time, even if they don't have a rash? And that's up to you. You get to know your baby's skin. If they're really sensitive and they always get rashes, then you probably do want to just put that barrier cream on with every diaper change. But if your kid's skin is fine and they don't get rashes very often, then just once they do get a rash, you can protect it a little bit, allow it to heal underneath that barrier cream. And then the diapers, I agree with you. Some babies are totally fine with whatever diaper you put them in. Some babies, they absorb better or they, they hold the leakage in more effectively. But those with sensitive skins, if they get a diaper rash, you may need to back off and use a bit more of a, again, quote unquote, natural brand without those added bleaches and scents and those types of things during those periods of time when they have a bit more of a diaper rash. Hey? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else around diaper rash? We both talk really quickly. We get lots of information in the short. I know. I like it. We're power talkers. Hey, Sarah. Yes, Alicia. Did you have any problems with newborn sleep? Oh my gosh. I sure did. Especially with my first. Me too. I wish I'd known more about what to expect going into it. I know. And I wish that I had known to create a sleep plan with my partner. I know. How can you support each other to get the sleep that you need while supporting your little baby? Totally. So guess what, guys? That's why we created the Newborn Sleep 101 course. In this course, we discuss what does newborn sleep look like and how can we help support that sweet little baby to become the best sleeper they can. While also supporting you and your partner as you navigate this complex sleep-deprived time. We talk about how to set up your nursery or your bedroom to optimize both your sleep and your newborn sleep. And we also start talking about how you can start implementing routines and schedules into your day and your newborn so that by the time they're three or four months, it's well-established. Because guess what? That's when they start to really need it. If you're interested in learning more, head to our website, www.shefoundhealth courses. We hope that you get better sleep than we did. <laughs> Okay, so why don't we go on to cradle cap? This is one that I think causes parents a lot of baby acne, right? Like a lot of angst, but it's totally normal and it's not worrisome or dangerous to your baby, but it's it does make it hard to get those like beautiful baby pictures when they've got cradle cap all over their head. But why don't we chat a little bit about cradle cap and how some ideas for management of that? Yeah, so my daughter had cradle cap and it was bad. Like if she, so cradle cap, the name says, you know, it applies this just on like the scalp, but it can actually go down to the forehead too. And so my daughter had cranial cap on the scalp and it went all the way down to the forehead. Um, and one interesting thing is actually caused by, uh, by a type of yeast. Super common. I see it all the time in practice. And I you brought up a really good point. It actually doesn't hurt the baby. If you don't want to treat it, you don't really have to. A lot of us do. I know I wanted to treat my daughter because it just... It, it, it stressed me out every time I saw that really scaly kind of yellowish thing on her forehead. So we ended up treating it. And the way I, what I recommend is a kind of the first step is choosing an emollient. So an emollient could be something like mineral oil or Vaseline and you apply it to those areas. And my daughter actually loved this because I make it a nice soothing head massage. So I, I rub it into all those flakes onto the scalp and into her little forehead. And often she'd actually fall asleep during the process. Then you kind of rub off the scales later on. You can use a comb. Like I found a comb worked really well for the scalp. And then I would just use a, a very clean face cloth that was down and for her forehead. So I would wipe off the scales with that. Then most of the time that will resolve. But if it doesn't, in some severe cases, I have prescribed steroid creams. But fortunately, with just the emollient and a little bit of kind of scrubbing, it all comes off. Yeah, it usually does resolve. I remember just sitting there breastfeeding my youngest and just picking it off. <laughs> yeah. So I would recommend putting the emollient on 
And then you can gently yeah. do that. If you pick it off too much when it's not softened up a bit, sometimes you can break the skin a little bit. Usually not, but just being careful around that. But I still have. And then every when she was two, I'd usually find these little bits and bops in her hair still and pick them off. So it can last a little bit of time. But again, it's Absolutely. not dangerous and it's not something that's worrisome. It bothers us as parents, I think, more than it bothers bothers the kids. And it doesn't mean that just like baby acne, it doesn't mean later in life they're going to be more prone to skin problems or more prone to acne. It's just one of those things that kind of come up quite commonly in those early weeks to months. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we chat a little bit about eczema? And eczema is one that I know I really struggle with in the office in young babies because a lot of babies have these dry patches all over the place and it's not necessarily eczema, but we, I don't know, call it baby eczema or baby dry skin. But the management is the same as it would be if they had quote unquote eczema. And certainly some families have a higher risk of eczema. So if you have eczema, the parent or seasonal allergies or asthma, your child is a little bit of a higher risk of having one of those as well. So maybe let's frame it as eczema, but it's also just those dry skin patches. And how do we manage those? Exactly. Yeah, it's so common. And you brought up a good point. Environmental it plays a role too, and genetics play a role too. I live in Edmonton, Alberta, and it gets so cold here and it's very dry. And so a lot of times in the winter months, people find that their eczema gets even worse here with the dry cold. So I see this a lot in my practice and for both of my kids, they have kind of spectrum that you're talking about. They don't necessarily have eczema, but they get that dry, kind of itchy, rough skin in the, win in the winter months. So what I do is uh, the first thing is I kind of try to make sure that I keep this routine every day. And they take a bath to make sure that I'm not using overly warm water because that can actually dehydrate the skin more. So making sure that I'm using, you know, more on the lukewarm side. And my kids actually kind of like a bit of a cooler bath. And then right after getting out of the bath, patting dry the skin, as I mentioned earlier, so that there's still a thin, thin layer of liquid and then locking in that moisture right away with a fragrance-free cream. Soaps when I use them towards the end of the bath so they're not further dehydrating the skin. And then I make sure... You think that, you know, my, skin, my little one's skin's getting a little bit dry. I make sure to moisturize, not just after baths, actually twice a day at least. So you brought up a good reminder before they get into their PJs, a little moisturize, rub down, relaxation. And then in the morning when they get up, we're getting them dressed for school. That's another great time to do it. And then avoiding things that, oh, sorry. No, I was just going to say for that one, before you put them in bed, you can use that even thicker, goopier one. Because you know, they're getting into their PJs and so it's going to be locked in and it's not going to be as annoying as if you were to use it during the daytime or in that morning. So like in the evening one, maybe you do that massage with a bit of a thicker, goopier ointment or cream. And then the daytime one, you might use a bit of a lighter cream because it's a bit more tolerable. Yeah, that's really good. And then avoiding things that we we know kind of hate the skin. I, I like wearing wool sweaters, but they're very itchy. So avoiding fabrics that are, can make people itchy. Wool is not good. Also strong detergents uh, also be irritating uh, for our skin. So washing our, uh, our clothing for people with sensitive skin and, and more uh, sensitive detergents, not super strong ones. And the other thing you can do is you can double rinse. So when you use your detergent, use a mild detergent, but then you can double rinse it before you put it in the dryer and don't use any, it's hard where I am, in Victoria, we don't get static cling. It's so funny when I moved here, I was like, oh, there's no static cling here. Whereas if you're in Edmonton, it's a serious yes. issue in wintertime. Right? But using those dryer sheets also add a little bit. They're often quite scented. So using a bit more of a natural or a light, more lightly scented, more lightly fragranced um, dryer sheet if you do need to use it because you live somewhere where there's lots of static cling. If you don't have yeah. static cling in your area, then don't bother using that. So just using super mild, you're getting the theme of this, using super mild products that are not scented, that don't have a lot of extra added stuff to them. So really getting good. And unfortunately, we're getting a lot better, but unfortunately, the more traditional baby products were all very scented, whereas now there's a lot of options and that we can use. And you don't need to use baby products. You can use regular human being products as long as they're mild and not scented on your baby. Cool. Well, that's a lot we got through in a short period of time. I know we're fast. We're turbo talkers. I like it. So we chatted about a basic skincare routine for your baby. We chatted about three of the more common things that come up. So we talked about diaper rash. We talked about cradle camp and we talked about dry skin or 
eczema, as we sometimes refer to it. But you have some really exciting products that I wanted to just give you a few minutes to chat about because this is this is a new wave of beta glucan. Tell me about that. It's a product that we use that actually has some really good evidence in locking in moisture. There are some studies on children with burns, mild to moderate kind of burns, and actually improve their outcomes. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that and what you've the project you're working on? Yeah. So I mentioned at the start of uh, this podcast, after I started the Life of Dr. Mom uh, blog, I started really connecting with our community. And, and, you know, I have a family practice too. And I really learned that once you're looking for trusted products, they want products that are, you know, evidence-based affordable um, and makes sense for the whole family. Uh, so one of the most common concerns I live in Edmonton, Alberta is dry, itchy and eczema skin. And I was doing some, one of the things I love when I can't, you know, unwinding for the night is I like going on skincare blogs. And in Asia, what is trending huge is something called beta glucan, as you mentioned, and it's actually a fiber that has been shown in clinical studies to help improve skin hydration and healing in multiple conditions. You mentioned burns, but also there's some studies for eczema out there too. And it was interesting because it's so huge in Asia, multiple companies are now using it. And I said, you know, that's really cool. And so I actually looked into beta glucan more and it was serendipitous. One of the largest beta glucan manufacturers in the world is in Alberta, Canada. Yeah. And the way that they extract the beta glucan is different than anywhere else in the world. It's with air technology. So this is the most natural beta glucan. They use air technology to separate the beta glucan from the barley. Whereas a lot of in other places in the world, they take beta glucan using chemicals and solvents. And what's special about beta-glucan, so beta-glucan, we have, a lot of us have already been using, but not in the concentrated form. So oatmeal baths, a lot of us recommend that for helping improve skin healing and hydration. And the reason that works is oatmeal contains three to 5% beta-glucan. Our bath using the uh, University of Alberta technology, actually that was where it was developed, use, make, is able to get 23% beta-glucan. So this is a very concentrated uh, solution. And once I started speaking to the manufacturer here, I said, you know what? I want to use beta glucan for skincare, similar to how it's being used in Asia. So they were able to manufacture uh, the beta glucan for me. And so I created the first product, which is a bath. So this is what I like to call our super powered oatmeal bath. And you use it once or twice a week and people can actually notice a difference right away. Actually, a lot of people notice it after one bath. Once you add it, your skin feels silky smooth. And then, so this has been going on since I launched it um, in the early winter and the response has been so positive. Just the before and after pictures, people reaching out and saying, you know, I really love it. But I think that's a little more convenient. Like I was thinking about making a cream. After months and months, we've been working on this. I've been working uh, with a compounding pharmacist. We actually launched our, our beta glucan cream uh, two weeks ago. So it's been super exciting just seeing, uh, getting some more before and after photos, people saying that they love it, which is so cool. That's exciting. Congratulations. That's, yeah, that's, that's often how these things come about as we, from a physician point of view, we hear it from our patients over and over and just see this need that's not being met. That's why Sarah and I started this online platform because what we were talking about the misinformation and people were just wanting to get good high quality information and, and so we were able to bring that forward and so your patients in Alberta again where the static cling is the dry air so they need help with their skin and so you're able to bring that forth and from a family practice perspective it, you have such this wide variety of or varied knowledge and experience with babies to old people and so learning from them and understanding what their needs are so that's so exciting congratulations thank you so much yeah no it's been it's a lot of work, but I love it. It just kind of airs me up every day. I love it. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit about where people can find you on social media? Yeah, so they can find me on Instagram, at Life of Dr. Mom, on Facebook too. And then I also recently started TikTok, something I'm still kind of learning. And it's also called Life of Dr. Mom. Awesome. And then you've got your blog post. Yes, lifeofdrmom.com. And my products can all be found on bydrmom.com, B-Y-D-R-mom.com. Cool. Awesome. So we'll put all those in the show notes so people can uh, find you if they want to connect a little bit. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thanks, Stephanie. It was great talking to you. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check out our website at www.shefoundhealth.ca and to sign up for our community for weekly bump blasts. Make sure to check us out on Instagram or Facebook at she.found.motherhood and head on over to your favorite podcast app and leave a review and a five-star rating. 
If you enjoyed this podcast, take a pic of yourself listening to it and share it on social. Make sure to tag us on it so we know to keep making them.